I'd like to begin tonight by introducing you to Tam Pham. Tam is a 48-year-old husband, father, and devout Buddhist who lives a quiet life in Richmond, Texas. After immigrating from Vietnam, Tam served 18 years in the Houston Police Department and wakes up every day at sunrise grateful for the gifts of living in and raising a family in the United States. For the past few years, Tam and his wife have been hard at work in their garage that they've converted into a test kitchen. Together, they've been testing old family recipes that they hope to adapt into a catering business for Vietnamese food. The people in Texas have raved about their food, so they decided to take a trip to Washington, D.C. to see whether they could find contacts in the Vietnamese community there to buy sausages in bulk for their business. Tam is also one of the over 800 insurrectionists who entered the Capitol on January 6, 2021. His story is not a singular anomaly. 90% of the rioters that day, like Tam, were not affiliated with any far-right white supremacist or militia group. Most, including some on the far right, were your local shop owners, doctors, neighbors, and police officers. So how did they end up in the Capitol? Well, for Tam, he saw his trip to D.C. as the perfect opportunity to work on his family's food business, see the capital of the country he loves, and hear what he predicted would be a historically entertaining speech from then-President Trump. But after I only saw photos on the news of the QAnon shaman and the violent mob of people entering the Capitol, as a 13-year-old, I was really scared. And so it was easy to think that all insurrectionists were like these people and much more difficult to see the real everyday people like Tam who supported beliefs different than my own. Growing up in the Bay Area, I've been surrounded by family, teachers, and friends who all shared similar liberal and progressive values, opinions, and outlooks. And I inevitably adopted those same beliefs. Surrounded by this echo chamber, there was constant reinforcement that my beliefs were the right ones. And so when our side lost, as it did in 2016, I was forced to reckon with why half the country voted the other way. And most of us, you know, we try to find some sort of rationale in our heads, but most pretty much end up convincing themselves that the other side is either uneducated, bigoted, or completely crazy. And so by the time I got to high school, I had a difficult time understanding why any rational person would support views different than my own. And I wasn't alone in this mindset. A 2020 study found that about identical majorities of both Democrats and Republicans reported having no one in their immediate social circle who held opposing political views. For example, Tam explained that as an active member in his temple and community, his daily exposure was only to other conservative Vietnamese Americans. And so while Tim himself had no initial particular interest in the 2020 campaigns or who would ultimately win the election, many of his closest friends sought to involve him in those conversations. Additionally, a 2019 study from the Pew Research Center found that about half of both parties, 55% of Democrats and 53% of Republicans, reported viewing those in the other party as more immoral than other Americans. Someone has to be wrong, right? This assumption of a right and wrong side and the widening division in the U.S. can be attributed to political polarization. Political polarization. It's not a new idea or unknown to most of us. You know, most Americans can say, hey, Whoever wins the election, we should try to cut down on polarization and, you know, return a civil to after the election. And the common response you hear is something like, I totally agree, followed by some statement like this. So the same Pew study found that 75% of Democrats and 64% of Republicans viewed members of the other party as more closed-minded than other Americans. So how is it possible for half the country to hold such drastically different beliefs, not only in politics, but also in their fundamental perceptions of themselves and one another. Because of my age, where I grew up, and what I heard and read on a daily basis, I struggled a lot with this question. 
and I found myself among these majorities. Then I left the Bay Area for a week and I got to travel with a group of complete strangers spanning across all ages, coming from different places in the US and abroad in completely different walks of life. It was there that I met Ev, a 75 year old evangelical Christian from Iowa, who I best remember for being incredibly cheerful, adventurous, and for wearing his favorite catch up with Jesus t-shirt almost every day. Besides having a pretty incredible style, Ev also happened to have very conservative views. And so while we were from completely different backgrounds, we bonded over a shared love of running and the outdoors. And I got to know him as a human first and a conservative second. With this foundation, when the conversation drifted to a question of beliefs or politics, it was exactly that, a conversation. Not an argument, not a debate, but rather an exchange of views to better understand where the other person was coming from and why they believed what they believed. Ev candidly told me, yeah, he only watches Fox News. And with a church community that echoed all the same opinions, he had never even thought to question his own beliefs. But before I could judge Ev for any limited perspective, I realized I also had to acknowledge the similar limitations shaping my own beliefs back home. While I had seen one's beliefs as a conscious choice, I was starting to see how in a lot of ways, it's really more of a fixed characteristic that reflects many demographic factors beyond one's control. That's not to say you can't change your beliefs, many people do, but it just might be a lot more difficult than we think. Listening to Ev's lived experiences and perspective on issues like climate change, abortion, and gun control gave me a new perspective on issues that I had seen as completely black and white. Through just a week together, both of our perspectives evolved and expanded. Ev and I were both forced to confront our own biases, looking inward and asking ourselves questions I think are worth all of us to genuinely consider in this moment. Who do I surround myself with and what are their beliefs? How has my media consumption been limited? And what implicit biases do I hold? There's no simple answers to these questions and I certainly can't give you an easy solution. Even with this introspection, I realize that I'll never be completely free of biases arising from my family, my school, and my everyday environment. But I've also learned that with conscious choices, keeping an open mind, reading widely, talking with diverse groups of real people, and having uncomfortable conversations, we can better connect across our differences and identify our own biases. The polarizing US society is not simply about changing minds, but it's about understanding that there are reasonable and open-minded people on the other side of most issues as well. If we advance the narrative of a shared fate and common values, we can avoid falling back into the trope of a divided America. Because as I've seen with Ev and as we've seen with Tam's story, we aren't that different. And to end on a more hopeful note, even in what can feel like an angry, factionalized society, Americans on policy might not be as different as we think or the media tells us we are. A new study from March of this year found that while Democrats and Republicans might differ on more specific issues, most share the same values on the country's founding principles. 90% of Americans, despite political affiliation, believe that the right to vote, the right to equal protection under the law, freedom of speech, the right to privacy, and freedom of religion are all extremely important to a functioning democracy. With so many of us feeling that democracy itself is under attack, realizing that those who don't agree with us are not as extreme as we may think can help us in how we approach political engagement. It can help us not give up on persuasion and compromise, to keep trying to recognize our commonalities through healthy and meaningful dialogue. So let us actively seek out diverse voices, let us challenge our own perspectives, and let us build a future we, where we can humanize those we might not agree with. What if you had lived in their shoes in another life? And what if you accepted them in this life? Thank you.